said I love to praise. Well, said I, I love the praises. Or do you love to praise? Praise him. Somebody say I love to praise. We love to praise. Praise him. Don't matter who's around. The mother. better be glad I can't sing like Rob. <laughs> I wouldn't even talk, man. I would just, how y'all doing? <laughs> Turn to Luke chapter 2. I wouldn't even talk no more. I would just, amen, amen, amen. Psalmist said, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Anybody glad to be here this morning? Anybody glad he woke you up? Glad he started you on your way? Glad he put food on your table? Glad you know where your children are? You, anybody, any glad folk in the building this morning? Knowing you like you know you, glad he showers you with grace and mercy. You do know what grace and mercy is, don't you? Grace is him giving you what you don't deserve, and mercy is him withholding from you what you do deserve. So everybody in here ought to have something to shout, something to thank God for, because I don't really know you like that, but I'm pretty sure you didn't do anything that deserved you waking up this morning. <laughs> Y'all talk back. And listen, listen, my mama taught me this. She said it's rude to look at somebody and don't say nothing to them. So y'all gonna, gonna help me this morning? <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm happy. I love Jesus. I, I, know, I know where I've been. I know what I've done. And, and, and him still putting up with me and, and loving me like he does. He spoils me like I'm his only child. And I, I just can't help it sometimes. If I, if I get too happy and I take off running, I'll be back. But y'all just, just don't know where. Any, anybody in here besides me? Yeah. The Lord has been good. Yes, he has. Yes, he has. I am, if you can't tell, I'm excited to be here this morning, and I am certainly thankful and grateful to your wonderful minister, uh, Brother Glenn, for the invitation to come and just to spend this time here with he and his beautiful wife and the leaders of this congregation and see some old friends in the audience and, and prayerfully some new friends, and it's, God is just good. Yes, he is. Yes, he is. Yes, he is. And so uh, we're going to go ahead and get to the word. This is your love explosion. And 
And we talked about love this morning, and we'll talk about love this afternoon from a, uh, from a different passage. But I want you to turn with me to Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10. Luke 10, let's, let's begin reading with verse number 30. Amen. And then just leave your Bibles open this morning. Luke 10, verse 30. All found? Yes, if you don't have it, say, wait a minute. All right, all right. This is the smart class. Isn't it? All right. <laughs> Luke 10, uh, verse number 30. Jesus replied, he answered, Man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. And he fell among thieves who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side, but a Samaritan. As he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. He went to him, bound up his wounds, pouring oil and wine. Then he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. Next day, he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him. Whatever more you spend, I will repay when I come back. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among thieves. He said, the one who showed him mercy. Yes. Jesus said to him, you go and do likewise. Yes. I want to talk about learning to love like Jesus. Yes. You may be seated. Learning to love like Jesus. One of my wife and I's favorite outings is to go to the movies. We love the movies. And she'll tell you that I don't like being late for the movie. We get in more arguments being late for a movie. I don't like to miss nothing. I even like to get there for the previews. Previews are where they show you clips of the movies that are about to come out. And to pique your interest, to get you excited, they normally show you the very best of the movie. They show you the, the best clip. It's normally a fight scene or a chase scene. Something that's exciting. Something attractive enough for you to say, I can't wait to see the whole show. There's another show that's coming to town. I don't know when it's coming. All I know is that it's coming soon. God is the producer, the Holy Spirit is the director, Jesus is the star, and, and they've left me and you here as clips, as previews of coming attractions that we ought to be so exciting, we ought to be so on fire, we ought to be so in love, we ought to show so much love, we ought to be so much of what they want that, that they see us, they say, I can't wait for the rest of that show to come out. It's for that reason that Jesus calls us into a life of discipleship. One of the primary purposes of this parable is to show us that there is a difference between salvation and discipleship. Discipleship is the graduate course to salvation. Salvation is freshman and sophomore business, but discipleship is for upperclassmen. Salvation is a response. Discipleship is a responsibility. Salvation starts with a confession. Discipleship starts with a commitment. Okay, salvation costs Jesus his life. Discipleship costs me my life. There's a great difference between salvation and Discipleship. Discipleship is that process of growth that takes place that should cause us every day to look more and more like Jesus. And, and so now, because I'm growing up, 
I don't do the things that I used to do anymore. I, I don't continue to blame everybody else for why I am, where I am, and who I am. But to be a disciple means to be a visible and verbal follower of Jesus Christ. I believe much of the problem in our world today is that many of us are satisfied simply with salvation. We never grow up into discipleship. And I don't know. Sometimes I blame the church for that. I, I, I don't know in the church if we focus enough on what happens after salvation. I mean, yes, we should be seeking the lost, but we should also be strengthening the saved. Because after I hear, believe, repent, and confess, and I'm baptized, what then? Too many times we act like that after I go through all of that, that that's where it stops. No, 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 no. That's where it starts. I don't, I don't, I don't know. That, that's the process called discipleship. And if we're honest, many of us struggle with the issue of wanting Jesus to be our Savior, but not our Lord. Because you being my Savior is what you do for me but you being my Lord is what I do for you. So when you really fall in love with Jesus, you'll tell him, take my mind and think your thoughts. Take my tongue and speak that that you would have me to say. Take my feet. Show me where you want me to go. Not my will, but thy will be done. That is the discussion that Jesus is having with this young Jewish lawyer here in Luke chapter 10. Go back with me. Uh, let's go up to verse number 25. We're still in Luke 10. Verse 25. And behold, the lawyer stood up to him to test him, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? What's the least that I can do and still be saved? He said to him, What's written in the law? How do you read it? And he answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, that's to love him passionately. With all your soul, that's to love him personally. With all of your strength, that's to love him powerfully. And with all of your mind, that's to love him pensively. And your neighbor as yourself. That's where the trouble comes in. Most of us have ease with the first and agony with the second. He says, love your neighbor as yourself Come on, he said to him you've answered correctly do this see it's in the doing this that you discover discipleship do this and you will live yeah. but he desiring to justify himself said to Jesus and who is my neighbor who who do I owe this type of love to Jesus said a certain man <laughs> he he then proceeds with a poignant parable on how to properly love people. He gives him several lessons on discipleship. The first one I see leaping out of the text is this. Discipleship is learning that everybody has the potential to fall. Verse number 30, Jesus replied, certain man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Let me help you with something right up front here. Anybody can fall. When you see somebody that's wounded and they've fallen, you don't know what happened in their life to get them to that point. Be careful looking down your nose at people. Be careful judging folk because you don't know what got them to the point where they are right now. Somebody looking at me now. You're not a bad person. You just fell. You got caught up in a situation and, and you fell. Some great innocent person got, got in a situation when you were young and some sick family member around you and did something they shouldn't have and you you're not a bad person you just fail somebody else in here you you've been married and you and, and you gave it your all and you stood across from somebody and you said for better or for worse for richer for poor for sickness and in health you said I do but you found out that they don't you didn't you just fail you didn't do anything you're not a bad person and that's what happens to a whole lot of folk they just fall and listen, I love this story because it lets me know that 
just coming to church won't stop you from falling either. Because look at this certain man. Look at this certain man. And don't miss the significance and the theology in his geography. Because it says that he's going down from Jerusalem down to Jericho. Jerusalem is the holy place. Jerusalem is the place that's filled with worship. Jericho is a place that's littered in idolatry. Jericho is the place filled with sin. This man coming from Jerusalem could have been coming from church and fail. Just because you go to church don't mean you don't have to live and work in Jericho and everybody has the potential to fall because everybody has to pass through Jericho every now and then. But listen, if you're a part of a body and you, and you fall and you're hurt, you would think that the rest of the body would come to the aid of the body member that's hurt, of the one that's wounded. You would think the rest of the body would come help out. I mean, your body does that. You ever, been, you ever been trying to hammer a nail and miss the nail and hit your finger? And after you said, worthy is the lamb, <laughs> the body then goes into action, doesn't it? The hand says, uh-uh, bring him, bring him here to me. The hand grabs hold of him squeezes him tight just to let him know that you're not in this thing by yourself that, that you ain't the only I'm here with you I'm here for you you ain't got to go through this by yourself and then after the hand gets through the mouth says uh uh bring him here to me I, I need to let him know I'm in here with him too and next thing you know that hand is in the mouth and everybody goes in the help mode because it's a part of the body but something is wrong when I fall and I can't Count on the body to help me get back up again. What you saying, preacher? Well, verse number 31 and 32 puzzled me because listen what it says. It says, now by chance a priest was going down that road. When he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place, saw him and passed by on the other side. I mean, the priest, the priest may have been on his way to Jerusalem while this man that failed was on his way to Jericho. And you know how sometimes church folk can get so busy doing church that we fail to love people that look like they're going in the opposite direction. We can get so busy doing church that we forget to be the church. Y'all wake up and talk to me in here. And then the Bible says this Levite, Levite walked up in the Levitical order. The Levite was the one that helped the priest in the temple. He was a, a, like a worship leader or, or a praiser. But the Bible says that he passed by the wounded man too because maybe he knew how to lead, but he didn't know how to love. Maybe he didn't have the character to keep him where his title wanted to take him. And listen, y'all, shame on the church when we see the wounded and we leave them without loving them. You need to know this morning, listen, anybody can fall. Anybody can mess up. Anybody can make a mistake. Anybody can have a sickness deplete your financial resources. You can be doing pretty good right now. But let's be honest in here. 99% of us are just one paycheck away. Holler if you hear me in it. 99% of us are one paycheck away from it being us in trouble. And I ain't just talking about money because the church can't be in the business of, of just giving out money to everybody either. I, I'm talking about your condition not being your conclusion. I know that to be true because the end of verse number 30 says this man that fell, he fell and he was left half dead. But that shows you how dumb the enemy is because if I'm half dead, that also means I'm half alive. And as long as I got breath in my body, the, the psalmist said, let everything that had breath praise the Lord. And, and David declared that God dwells in, he lives in the praise of his people. So don't count me out as long as I got God in me. I may be down now, but if you like seeing me down, you better take a picture because I ain't going to stay there. 
Oh, come on here. As long as I got enough breath to shout Jesus. Are y'all in here with me this morning? As long as, don't leave me alive enough to shout Jesus because at the name of Jesus, everything changes. At, at the name of Jesus, demons tremble. At the name of Jesus, sick folk get well. At the name of Jesus, dead folk get up. It's that name. There's so much power in the name. They, they tell me, they tell me that Harvard and Yale are not accredited schools. <laughs> Harvard and Yale are not accredited because they say there's no accreditation that can match the name. Just the name alone. You come out of Harvard or Yale, just the name alone. That's how it is with Jesus. Just the name alone. If you can shout his name. I know, I know life gets hard. I know the, uh, the job gets hard. I know the home gets hard. But listen, just shout the name of Jesus. And if you call him into any situation, anybody here know things change when you call Jesus? And so, so, discipleship is... Learning that anybody can fall, but discipleship is also learning how to love people that you don't like. Yes, sir. <laughs> when, when the priest and the Levite passed him by, verse number 33 says that it was a Samaritan that stopped and showed compassion on this broken, wounded, fallen man. And the tension of the text takes up right here because the New Living Translation lets us know that this broken, fallen, wounded man was a, that the Samaritan helped was a Jew. Jews don't like Samaritans in part because they were the lowest sociocultural class of people. Jews were second class under Roman rule. Samaritans bordered on third class at best. Uh, they, they were a, a half-breed of the Israelites and their Assyrian conquerors. The Jews felt as though the Samaritans were beneath them. They despised Samaritans. We have further evidence of that when Jesus encountered that woman at the well in John chapter 4 because she was a Samaritan that he asked for a drink. And what initially surprised her the most was she said, how be it that you, a Jew, would ask me, a Samaritan, for a drink? You know Jews don't have nothing to do with Samaritans. So it makes perfect sense for this fallen man to be a Jew because it wouldn't be worth Jesus' time to tell the story if it was a Samaritan. The impact of the parable would have been lost because that would have just been a Samaritan helping another Samaritan. And Jesus himself said, you haven't done too much if all you can do is love those that are like you. If all you can do is love folk that love you. But when you grow up into discipleship, you learn how to love people that you know don't like you. I got Bible for that. Jesus said, love your enemies. Do good to them that hate you. He said, if your enemy is hungry, feed them. If they're thirsty, give them something to drink. And the attitude that this Samaritan had is that although we may be racially different, economically different, spiritually different, I still love you. Bible says that he has compassion on him. And, and compassion in its simplest form means this. It means that you cannot come past a person who's hurting and wounded and not show them the love of Jesus Christ. Don't miss that. Don't miss that because the priest and the Levite that passed him by were the church folk. Yeah. <laughs> I found out that the problem with us church folk is that we have a real hard time loving those that are not like us because we have a real hard time loving those that are like us. <laughs> Say preach boy. <laughs> Come on here. I mean, I, I, it, 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 it shocks me, it appalls me to see church folk, to see Christians 
dogging each other out and arguing with each other and talking bad about each other on Facebook. You know? Hey man, somebody, come, come on here. On the world wide web, for the world to see Christians not getting along and belittling one another and talking bad about each other on the world wide web. And we don't even need the world wide web. We got, you can go down to the beauty shop. Hey, say amen if you can. You, you can go down to the barber shop. You can see us dogging each other out. So no wonder we have a difficult time loving folk that are not like us. We have a hard enough time loving folk that are like us. But in order to be a disciple, you got to learn to love people that you know don't like you. you you're going to have to bite your tongue sometime. You're going to have to take low sometime. You're going to have to be quiet sometime. You stop giving everybody a piece of your mind. You're going to have to grow up to learn how to love folk that don't like you. And I know y'all don't act like this this way, but back up 45, I got folk at my church that'll say, Pastor, I love them, but they, they better not say nothing to me. They better not say nothing to me. I, you know, I, boo boo, they, they better not say nothing to me. I'm glad y'all don't act like that up this way. I said, that ain't love? What kind of love is that? We have to learn how to love. Jesus said in John chapter 13, verse 35, by this, Shall all men know that you are my disciples? How they going to know it, Jesus? By the sign on the building? No. How they going to know it? By how many people I can show how they going to hell? No. Are they going to know by how judgmental I can be as a Christian? No. They'll know by how you love each other. How you pick people up when they're down. How you dust them off. How you clean them up. How you forgive them. How you bring them in. That's how they'll know that you belong to me. That's what this Samaritan had even for a Jew. Because think about it, he could have easily done like the others did, crossed over on the other side, passed him by and not helped him. Nobody would have blamed him. They would have said, well, man, he, he don't like you anyway. That's right. But it's 2015. Christians got to grow up. We, we got to grow up. You got to learn how to take some stuff. You, you got to learn how to love people. Even in the church. I, you know, I used to, used to bother me when folk would come to church and wouldn't speak to me. I'm the preacher. How you know not speak to me? It don't bother me as much no more as it used to. I mean, because I, I tell them, I love them. I love you, but I ain't come for you. I'm glad you're here. And, you know, we can get a, but I didn't come here for you. And you got to grow up into that, though. You got to grow up to learn how. Not, I'm not leaving a flawless Jesus over flawed people. I'm not going to leave the church. I'm not going to leave a perfect savior over imperfect people. And too many times we get upset because somebody sat in our seat or parked in our spot or, or didn't speak or didn't or they said this about me. And we look at distancing ourselves from the church like you're going to hurt them. Okay, okay, okay. D discipleship, learning anybody can fall. Um, discipleship is also learning how to love people that you don't like. But then uh, the third thing is this. Discipleship is learning how to follow the example of Jesus Christ. Amen. Look at verse number 33 with me. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was. And when he saw him, he had compassion on him. He went to him and bound up his wounds pouring oil and wine on it, then set him on his own animal and brought him to the inn took, and took care of him. In order to love like Jesus, uh, several things you got to do, but one of them, in order to love like Jesus, sometimes tough love is the answer. I know that to be true. He said that he poured wine on the wound. Everybody in here knows that wine on an open wound is going to sting. It's going to burn. But while it's hurting him, it's also cleansing him. While it's hurting him, it's helping him because being a disciple means that I got to love you enough not to let you stay where you are. Sometimes I got to tell you something you don't want to hear. Sometimes the truth is going to hurt and you need people around you that love you enough to offend you. I mean, offend me if it's going to clean me up. Offend me if it's going to make me better. Sometimes the truth hurts. Amen. Then it says that he, he put him on his own animal. 
Uh, for him to put him on his animal, that means that he had to get down off the animal. And if you're going to be a disciple, you're going to have to get down off your high horse. Okay. Sometimes you're going to you're gonna have to learn how to take low. You're going to have to learn how to be quiet. you got to realize that you don't know everything. we got to learn how to humble ourselves because Jesus, who had no reason to humble himself, did, while we who have every reason to humble ourselves won't. But if you're going to be a disciple, then you've got to follow the example of Jesus Christ. Amen, somebody. We got to stop as Christians. We got to stop thinking that we're better than somebody else because you know a few scriptures that they don't know. You don't look down on people because they're not where you are right now. No, you love them. You help them. You, you love them till they get there. Some people are on an elevator. Others are on an escalator. It may take them a little longer to get there, but while they're on their way, love them and help them while you're waiting. I'm just trying to help you this morning. I'm trying to be helpful because Belford, people are going to come in here. They're going to come in these doors that don't know all the rules. They don't know how to act. They don't know what to do, what to say, what to wear. But love them when they come in. Amen. You got to love them because when you, when you cast a net out there, you don't know what's going to come up. And the problem with the church a whole lot of time is that we want to clean the fish before we catch the fish. It don't work like that. You got to catch them and trust God to clean them. The church got to stop acting like we're better than others. Stop acting like we got to where we are without somebody helping us. Somebody help you get where you are. There was this man, there was this man, true story, that... Oh, Mail. He couldn't afford to get home for Christmas. From New York, he mailed himself from New York to DeSoto, Texas. A few years ago, true story. This man got in a box. The box was sent from New York to DeSoto, Texas. Had two little cutouts in the box. And when the delivery driver got it there, got it to, all the way to DeSoto, Texas, picked it up took it to his mama's front porch and set the box down, he saw these two eyes poking up out the box. So he gets scared. He runs back to the truck, calls the police. The police show up. They arrest the man because apparently it's against the law to mail yourself. I don't know. <laughs> but after they arrested the man, they started looking for his accomplice because they said this. They said, there's no way he could have done all of this by himself. He couldn't have gotten in a box and closed the box and taped the box and got to UPS and got on the plane and got somebody helped him get where he, that's all I'm trying to tell you in here this morning. You, somebody helped you get where you are. You didn't get here by yourself. So how dare we look down on somebody because they're not where we are. Pick them up. Help them get there. They, they on their way. You, when you were on your way, somebody helped you. The verse number 34 and 35, and I'm finished. He went, he, went, he went to him, bound up his wounds, pouring oil and wine. Then he set him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, took care of it. The next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, take care of him. Whatever you spend, I will repay when I come back again. The Samaritan is a follower of the excellent example of Jesus Christ because he's not just going to leave this man in the condition that he's in. I mean, the man is hurt, he's wounded, he's half dead, and he got a debt that he can't pay. Who does that remind you of? Anybody in here realize you were hurt, you were wounded, you were half dead, and you had a debt that you couldn't pay, but Jesus Paid it all and all to him we owe sin left a crimson stain, but he washed it whiter than snow. That's discipleship. It calls us into a deeper relationship, deeper relationship of Christianity. You being a Christian means that you are an eon of Christ. You are a miniature replica of Jesus Christ. That's discipleship. At our church, it's like they do here. They, they tape the sermons every Sunday. They record the sermons. 
folk that want to go to the bookstore and buy it or they want to give it to somebody else, they record the sermons. They record them on a master CD. But now, when you go to the bookstore to purchase the CD, you can't purchase the master copy. You can't purchase the master. The master can't go home with you. So when you go buy it, what you buy is a copy. But listen, the copy looks just like the master. The copy sounds just like the master. In fact, when you get it home, you can't even tell the difference between the copy and the master. That's what Jesus wants for you and I. He, he wants us to be so much like him that we act like him, we talk like him, we walk like him, we forgive like him, we live like him, we love like him. He wants us to be the copy that looks so much like the master. Jesus, Jesus said that this is what I've called you to do. I, I want the church, the church is still here to go make, watch this, not members, but go make disciples. There's a difference between membership and discipleship. Members get their feelings hurt and they just leave and won't ever come back. Members think they're doing God and the church a favor by them showing up. But disciples understand that if it had not been for the Lord on my side, there's no telling where I'd be. With, with what I've done, with what I know about me, and I got to be honest with you, this, this lesson uh, bothered me. This lesson was tough for me to prepare because I have a difficult time with that. I mean, it's, it's anybody else an honest, honest in here besides me? It's easy to love folk I know love me. <laughs> it's easy to love you if you're nice to me and you treat me right. But the difficult thing is to love folk that I know. For I know don't mean me any good and, and to love them anyway because I want to go to heaven and there's nothing you can do or say that I'm going to forfeit heaven for you so I'm going to love you anyway. Think about if the church ever gets that. The church ever gets contagious and infectious with that. That folk that going up and down the street that all they know about us is how much we love each other. You know what all they know about us now. Well, how much we fight each other. That's our, that's our resume. But if they start to figure out, them folk, they love each other. Them folk are not going to leave a man on the side of the road hurting and wounded. They, they're going to pick him up and clean him up. And, and, and they're going to help you get back on your feet. So my prayer for you this morning is that, is that, you are on your way. If you're not there yet and all of us are a work in progress, that you're on your way to discipleship, that, that this thing is getting real with you, that you're not just coming on Sunday playing with him, that this is not just a ritual, something to do to start the week out, that this thing means something to you and that when you go to work tomorrow that you know you're not representing yourself, but you're representing Jesus Christ because somebody got to see that there's something that's different about you. So if you're here and you need to restore or recommit yourself or reevaluate your relationship with Jesus, we want you to come down this morning. If you're here and you've never put him on in water baptism for the remission of your sins, why don't you come? If you believe Jesus is God's son, as long as you believe that, the rest of it we can learn together. If you believe that, Come and be buried with him in baptism. If you're here and you need to repent of your sin or you need a church home, whatever your need is, why don't you come as together we stand and I sing a song to encourage one another. Long. I admit that I've done wrong. Well, I'm just like the prodigal son. I